Hello and welcome to RT Ministries. My name is Dwayne and this is the Bible study portion of RT Ministries. Um, if you turn with me, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Um, isn't it great that you got the Bible? I mean, how else would anybody know how to live in this world or what God thinks or you know, outside of the Bible? And I don't understand, I don't even know how people can live the Christian. There's a lot of Christians I know that don't hardly really ever read the Bible. I don't know how in the world, you know, anybody can do that. So... The Bible is very important. Mark chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They have already been with me three days and they have nothing to eat. Now first, you know, you can... you got to ask yourself, when you look at people out there, do you have compassion on people? You know, if you see lost people out there, you should have, they should be like lost sheep to you. You know, they need guidance. They need God's word. You know, and we should ask ourselves if we have compassion on other people like Christ did. Verse 3, if I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way. Because some of them have come a long distance. For his disciples answered, but where is this remote place? But we're in this remote place. Can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to, to set before the people as they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave, them, he gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were all left over. About 4,000 men were present, and having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Delamatha. Now, Jesus, there must have been around 10,000 people there, because other, other Gospels say there was 4,000 4, plus women and children. So, with a few loaves of bread and a few fish, Jesus fed the multitude, around roughly 10,000. You know, God, this is a good picture. God can do anything he wants to do, right? If you're walking with the Lord and talking with the Lord, you can count on the Lord because he can, it's his world. He made everything into it. He made the few loaves of bread and fish multiply to, you know, think of 10,000 people, how much that would take to feed them. And he had basketfuls left over. That certainly shows you you can't outgive God. And you can trust him in anything you need. Verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. I'd like to stop here on the question thing. You know, there's a lot of people on the internet and everywhere else that have questions, but a lot, a lot of them have ulterior motives before they even ask you questions. They aren't asking you questions for truth. They're asking you questions to argue or to get their doctrine across. You know, I find very, there's certainly a lot of people, especially in the Bible, the Pharisees were like that. They questioned Jesus, but they weren't trying to find the truth. They were just trying to trip him up or to try to change his doctrine. To question him, to question Jesus. See in the text says to test him. That's the only reason to ask the question. They asked him for a sign from heaven. Now, there's a lot of people alive right now who like to see signs. You know, there's a charismatic movement out there where people, you know, worship, but they like to see the spiritual stuff. They like to see people rolling around. They like to see their, you know, Jesus. What did Jesus say about a generation that seeks after a sign? He said they're an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And the generation out here is getting more evil and more adult, adult committing spiritual adultery. And all they want to see is signs. So they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, now Jesus sighed because he knew what was in him. Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign shall be given to it. He left them, got back in his boat and crossed to the other side. So Jesus just said, look, <laughs> no, no sign will be given to you. And he left. Sometimes some of the short answers are the best. You know, not just because you're asked a question doesn't mean you have to answer either. Jesus was asked a lot of questions, and Pilate asked him questions, he just kept silent. Sometimes it's all right not to answer. You don't have to say anything. And remember, Christians out there, you don't have to defend God and what he does. Just stand on the Bible. 14, the disciples have forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. 15, be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. 
And they discussed with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? They still weren't getting it. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And the answer to that question, they were still had hard hearts. Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears to fail but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves and the five thousand? How many back basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. And he said to them, Do you still not understand? Um, Jesus said, Beware. Let's see. Where you, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. What are the yeast of the Pharisees? Well, first off, what's yeast? If you put yeast in bread dough, it permeates the whole dough, right? You can't just add a little yeast and it just affect one little part of the dough. If you add a little bit of yeast, it's going to affect the whole dough. So he said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. You know, when false teachers or religious people are allowed into a church and allowed to, to get away with spreading false garbage in church, it spreads like yeast. It affects everybody. This is why church discipline is important. So Jesus just warned them, watch out for their teaching. And again, the modern church right now, oh my goodness, you got to watch out for teaching out there. There's a lot of bad teaching out there that sound good. But you got to know your Bible. If you know your Bible, you'll be able to sift through it all. So Jesus just warned them about their teaching. Watch out for the teaching. Verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, and his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, Don't go into the village. It was funny that Jesus spit in his eyes and then touched his eyes with his hands. And Jesus put his hands on his eyes once, and he said, I, I see things that look like trees. So he's just beginning to see. And Jesus put his hands back on him, and he opened his eyes fully. And then he sent them home saying, don't go into the village. You know, when Jesus did a miracle, he didn't, he, did, he didn't proclaim it to everyone. He didn't want people following him because of miracles. Quite the opposite of most of the, a lot of these miracle movements on TV. They want you to follow them because of their miracles. And that's quite the opposite of what Jesus did and taught. Verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, this is a very, very, very important question. This is a very important question to you who are listening out there. Who do, who do you say Jesus Christ is? And anyone in this world, this is the most important question you'll ever answer. Who is Jesus Christ? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, one of the prophets. So they were telling them, there were some people around in that area saying, look, he's, he's uh, John the Baptist, or they didn't quite know who he was. And Jesus narrowed it down. He said, what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? So he looked right at Peter and said, who do you say I am? Peter answered. I gave, he gave the answer here. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. Uh, that's a, that's, a more, that's a real important question to answer yourself. You know, if he's the Christ to you, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. This is, this is the foundation of the whole Christian faith. And 30, Jesus warned him not to tell anyone about him. So Peter was given this from heaven, that he is the Christ, the chosen one of God, the substitution for our sin. He is the... the uh, main concept. He is Christianity. You know, the whole Christian, Christian faith is, is uh, based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and His power to forgive sins. So, again, it's important if you ask anybody out there, who is Jesus Christ? To a lot of them, He's nothing. But if He is the Christ to you, then <laughs> praise God. 31. Then He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, 
that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay, now he's telling the disciples, look, I'm going to have my... He's telling them, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to be treated bad, and I'm going to die. And he's going to be killed and three days rise again. And He spoke plainly to him, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now he's telling Peter, look, I'm going to have to die. I'm going to be treated really bad. I'm going to... As soon as I die, I'm going to come back. But then Jesus said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to die. Now, is that a bad thing to... Say to the Lord, sounds kind of concerning for the Lord, right? No, Lord, I don't want you to die. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, okay, now, first off, when Peter said this to him, he turned around and looked at all the other disciples before he looked at Peter. Because he, he, wanted, he, he wanted to see, what, you know, when you say something like that, there's other people listening. Anything you say about the Lord out there, there's other people listening. You know, your, your answers and your actions affect other people. He looked at his other disciples, he rebuked Peter. Out of, out of my sight, Satan, he said to him, you do not have the, in mind the things of God, but the things of men. All right, Jesus turned to Peter and said, out of my sight, Satan, or get behind me, Satan, other translations say. Now, how did Peter turn into Satan there? Now, Peter was used as Satan's mouthpiece there. Now, Jesus could see that it was Satan talking behind Peter, but Peter thought he was talking on his own will. You know, and again, when Peter went to the Lord, not a bad thing to say, Lord, I don't want this to happen to you, but he didn't have the things of God in mind. You know. So he said, Out of my sight, Satan said, You do not have the you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So a true Christian would have the things of God on, on their mind, and obviously, you know, Peter at this time didn't have the things of God, he had the things of men on his mind, but you know, Satan used him as a mouthpiece. He didn't even know he was being used as a mouthpiece. It's important for us Christians to have the things of God on our mind, right? Things of God on our mind. I heard one guy tell me, you, you could be too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. I don't think that's possible. I don't think you could be heavenly minded enough to be earthly good. You know, if the more your mind's into heaven, the more your mind's into God, the better, the better you can handle life and the better, you know, the more God will work through you here on this earth. And again, Peter had the things of men in mind. He just thought about Christ immediately, his immediate uh, welfare. He, didn't, he wasn't looking ahead of all this. He didn't think about a plan of God. He didn't do anything, but Jesus had his mind on the things of God. 34, when he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, he said, if anyone will come after me, okay, here he is, he must deny himself. Now that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? It's the opposite of selfish. You've got to deny yourself. That means you've got to stop in life doing what you want to do, and your goals have got to be pushed aside. And take up his cross. Now, on that day, the cross meant death. It meant nothing good in that day. It wasn't a little symbol you wore around your neck. It meant nothing good. So people knew when he said to take up your cross, it meant misery, death, pain, agony. It meant everything the opposite of what it means today. It was just a way people died and were tortured. So he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and then he said, follow me. Wherever the Lord Jesus Christ wants to take you, if you're going to be his disciple, he said, I'll follow you wherever you go. So you've got to be willing to deny yourself. I'm going to say this again because it's important. Deny yourself. Put a, push aside all your life goals, your family, your job, everything. Pick up your cross, which means torture, death, agony, all the bad stuff. Because there is a price on following Christ. And then he said, follow me. After you've done all that, then you're in the position to follow him. Right? If you haven't denied yourself, you can't follow him. If you haven't picked up your cross, you can't follow him. Only when you do them two things can you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. 35. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Now this is the people who won't deny themselves. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. If you want to save your life and your ambitions and your job and your family and all that and put all that before the Lord, you've just rejected Jesus Christ, then what, what good has all that done you in the end when you go to hell? What good has that done you? Nothing. But whoever loses his life, that means the one who does deny himself, pushes his life aside, picks up his cross and follows him. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. That means in the end you'll be saved. Salvation. 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? 
If you give up Jesus Christ for a job, what good is it? Eternally you'll be in hell. What good has it done you? Or if you even have the whole world, if you have control of the whole world's money system, everything, you had everything. Sex, drugs, all this stuff. If you had all that stuff, what good is it if you give up your soul? Well, the answer, what good is it if a man to gain the whole world and yet for his soul is no good? Remember, the next life is eternal. This life is very temporal, 60, 70 years for most of us. Or what can a man give exchange for his soul? It's a good question to ask people. What has man given in exchange for his soul? Well, drugs, selfishness, greediness, covetousness, money, sex, all that stuff people give up for their soul. Or they, you know, they take that and then give up their soul. What good is any of that if you've given up your soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? And there's a lot of people that exchange a lot of things for eternal damnation. You know, in the day, I've never... I've been at a lot of people's bedsides when they've died, and none of them have ever said, "I wish I could, you know, I could, wish I could go back and do my job again over. I wish I could go back and whatever pursuits they they ran after in life, you know, most of them are miserable at the end. And it's went by fast, and they're scared because now they're dying, and ju they know judgment's coming. And so, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And the answer is a lot. People give up a lot. 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and evil generation, now we could say we live in an adulterous and evil generation right now because it certainly is evil, certainly adulterous out there. But if you're ashamed of his words out there, guess what? He said he'd be ashamed of you when he comes in his glory with his heaven, with, when he comes in his glory, his father's glory with the holy angels. Who said he'd be ashamed of you? You know, a lot of us, a lot of us hide Christ out in the world because we're too ashamed to admit we know him, or even know about him. So this verse should hit home for a lot of people. I'll read it again. This comes from the Bible. If anyone was ashamed of me and my words, now I said of him and his. Words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. I think we'll stop there at verse uh, 9. Chapter 9. What can you take? Every chapter, every Bible study you have, you should take away something from it. You know, I think, uh, I think the thing that sticks out with me is, you know, we should be careful how we're... Uh, Obviously, the deny, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him is, is hugely important. This is what separates the true Jesus from the false one. Because a false Jesus out there requires you to do nothing other than believe in him. Another, you know, this is the false Jesus is the one that puts up with everything. He doesn't require you to repent. He doesn't require you to do anything. Just believe in him and go back to your life. That's not the true Jesus. The true Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. And then he said... The shame part. If you're ashamed of him, then you have too much of the world left in you. You hold the world way too high. Remember, 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 remember. If you're, if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. We'll catch up with verse 9, or excuse me, chapter 9 next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.